The Roman aqueduct of Pont du Gard is one of the greatest sights in all of ancient history. It's an incredibly impressive structure. In fact, it's the tallest ancient bridge and the second highest structure the Romans ever built after the Colosseum in Rome, which is just six feet higher. Not only is this a work of great engineering, but it has come down to us as one of the most important works of art of the ancient world, a work of great architecture, recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It was built to carry water from the countryside into the city of Nîmes, which was a big Roman center back in those days. And it continued carrying water for 500 years. Really a remarkable structure. You can get different viewpoints. This is a very nice viewpoint, especially in the morning. In the afternoon, you can go on the other side of the bridge for better lighting. That middle arch is the largest arch the Romans ever built, the lower level and the upper level, both the widest span that they ever crossed. So up on top, you got the water channel. It's a covered water channel so that uh, it was protected from the elements. The interior surface of the water channel was covered with a special stucco that was composed in part of shards of pottery and tile, and then it was covered with an olive oil surface. And this made sure that it was very smooth and slippery so that the water could easily flow. Partly open and partly covered, forming a dark tunnel that tall folks will need to stoop to get through. It's in a beautiful setting. The river valley here is just really quite gorgeous. You have the forest and the rocky shores on both sides. Makes it a very picturesque setting. If you walk along the path in front of the bridge for about a quarter mile and then come down to the river level itself, you get quite a spectacular reflection on a normal day with the calm waters of the river and the bridge looking like it's a double bridge above and below. It's really worth it. If you're here on a day when there's not very much wind, by all means, take the time to come on down the river and have a look from the riverbank. You want to climb up the hill and look along the bridge. Different viewpoints, different perspectives, and you surely want to walk out to have this kind of a view. On a cloudy, bright day like this, it really looks perfect. And you will enjoy it very much. Here are some practical tips for how to get around and experience the various views and the different walking routes while you're visiting. You'll approach on the path from the information center and you'll first see the aqueduct from the path, then walk up a little bit and then down and along the riverbed to look back at the bridge. On the bridge is another viewpoint, then cross to the other side to look back then walk up the path to the top and you can look straight along the bridge. Now the best of all is walk down the hill. You have to walk along the riverbank for a few hundred meters and there you have the finest view of all. Here you will have a complete mirror reflection of the bridge and the river's smooth surface which will be one of the most beautiful sights you have ever seen. Three levels of soaring arches above and again repeated upside down below. Unbelievable. It's one of those jaw drop, heart attack moment. Look in awe and wonder. Coming all this way to Pont du Gard, you want to fully enjoy the various vistas for a complete appreciation. The paved path from the visitor center affords some decent views, but don't settle for only this. Stroll up to the bridge and you can go on a well-marked hillside path to gain access to look at the aqueduct's upper level. There are steps to take you a little bit higher, but you will get a better view by walking down on a path along to the river's west bank to get further away so you can see the entire large structure. If you're in the afternoon, as we are, an excellent viewpoint is on this southwest side with the sun shining directly on the stones. It's so big you can't see it when you're standing close. Of course, you have to snap your photos, which will be award winners, but don't forget to put the camera away and just soak it up for as long as you can. Now here you're gonna acquire first-hand respect for the amazing engineering skill that created this marble. 
There are even better viewpoints on the other side of the river, so don't quit yet. Stroll across the bridge and then up a well-marked hillside path to gain access to the aqueduct's upper level, where you can walk along the path and have a bird's eye view of that upper level. You might wonder, how could they ever lift the stones so high up from the valley bottom 150 feet high in the air? And these are very big rocks. Well, not much of a problem for those ancient Roman engineers. They were very good with block and tackle, with pulleys and ropes and gears and wheels. They understood the principles of engineering construction very well. That's how they were able to build so many monuments throughout their empire. Just imagine the perfection of engineering that went into creating this long canal. Walk back downslope on the well-marked trail, heading for the best view of all. There's a nice stone staircase that winds around and goes back underneath the aqueduct. Keep going on the dirt path, bringing you further down. And then along the stream on the sunny southeast side of the structure in order to reach the very best view. Keep walking along the river on the sunny side of the bridge for a few hundred yards to get to the most superb view looking back towards the soaring masterpiece. There is a nicely paved path you follow along the riverside. However, if the viewing conditions are good, with midday or afternoon sunshine and little or no wind, you will need to leave the paved path to find the perfect angle. You have to walk on the dirt bank down to the water line. Yes, it's a bit slippery, irregular, rocky and sometimes muddy, but don't be dismayed. Here's the view along the river walkway revealing that perfect spot to stand. Just don't fall in. You'll get an excellent perspective, especially if it's a sunny day or calm, bright overcast with no wind, when you'll probably see a spectacular reflection of the arches mirrored in the water. You cannot see this full reflection from the paved path. So you're confronted with this opportunity to put in a little extra effort for a big payoff. On the paved path, oh, what a nice view. But down in the mud, it will enter your top 10 ever sightings. Of the 2 million annual visitors, only a tiny fraction ever get this angle. This is one of the world's most astonishing ancient sites. And with these viewing strategies, you can see it at its best. Let this be another general lesson for you on the value of extra effort and looking for angles beyond the obvious. Of course, this is already an immense structure, but the astonishing dual image appearing above and below with the bridge reflected in the calm waters of the river makes it look like the aqueduct is twice as big. Nobody's quite sure who the architect was, the names of the engineers, but one rumor is that it might be Marcus Agrippa, who was one of the great Roman engineers who built a number of waterways back in the city of Rome. And he was a quite noble statesman, upper class fellow. It's a remarkable bridge to get the water from one side of this valley to the other. They didn't have pressurized water pipes that could go down a slope and then back up a slope. Whenever an aqueduct came upon a chasm or river valley, it had to continue across as a bridge in order to maintain a level course for the water. The water source near the city of Uzez and the destination at Nîmes are only 12 miles apart, but the aqueduct is 31 miles in length, or 50 kilometers, because it takes a winding course around some foothills to match the contours of the landscape. The actual descent in height over that entire length is only 41 feet, an extremely small average gradient of just one in 3,000. The Pont du Gard structure descends a mere 2.5 centimeters, which is just enough to keep the water flowing at the right speed. You don't want the water to flow too fast, it'll wear away at the canal, and you don't want to go too slowly because then it stagnates. Towards Nîmes, the water channel gets nearly flat in some places, with astonishing gradient of 1 in 14,000. They estimate that it took about 27 hours for the water to flow along the entire course and four kilometers of the aqueduct are actually drilled right through solid rock forming tunnels. 
a remarkable precision from those ancient Roman engineers. The bridge itself is about 300 meters long, so it's really a small fraction of the total length of this long aqueduct, bringing water in from the distant countryside to Nîmes. But the Pont de Gare is certainly the masterpiece of the entire long canal. The Romans picked this location for the bridge because the river is slightly narrower here and there was a good outcrop of rock in the river that was strong enough to support the huge structure. The bridge construction was generally done without the use of mortar or clamps. The stones were cut so perfectly that they were held together by gravity and friction. And this was a typical Roman technique. Paradoxically, a huge stone structure like this that's held together by friction and gravity can better withstand an earthquake than if it were relied on mortar to hold it together. That's because everything has to fit so tightly and be in such good balance that the structure achieves the stable internal strength, which is much stronger than being glued together by mortar. The protruding stones supported the original construction scaffold, and they were left in place to assist with future maintenance work. The most upper level of the channel did use some mortar to hold the stone slabs. This is the actual water channel itself. And so to help waterproof this channel, keep the water in, they used mortar to hold the stones together as well as to make it watertight. Now we were very fortunate on this visit that the canal itself was open. At certain times of day, you can take a guided tour that will bring you inside the channel for an extra three euro on your ticket. Well worth it. And so we walked through and here's what it looked like inside. In the ancient times, it was completely covered over to protect the water. During its hundreds of years of use, the aqueduct had to be carefully maintained by the ancient Romans because things would grow, plants and calcite accretions would grow on the inside of the limestone channel. And so constant maintenance was necessary to scrape it off and keep the water flowing. Even if the channel is not open during your visit or you don't want to spend the time or money, you can still have a nice look at it from the outside of the gate. That's when you've climbed to the upper level. Three levels of arches hold up the water channel that runs across the top. Their buildings relied heavily on the arch for many interior Roman spaces were differing variations on this critical feature. It's believed to have taken about five years to build the bridge and about 15 years for the entire aqueduct with a thousand workers, including slaves and skilled craftsmen. After the collapse of the Roman Empire and barbarian invasions, the aqueduct began to fall apart and no longer carried water, but was strong enough to be used as a footbridge for another thousand years where you paid a toll to get across. In the mid-18th century, a new bridge was constructed, connected to the arches of the lower level, and wide enough for carriages to pass. This old diagram shows the adjacent connected bridges. This became the new toll bridge. And with further stabilizing, it was used by automobiles right up through the 20th century. Well, that added bridge is still used today by pedestrians, and that's what provides access for visitors to reach the other side of the river. A very good way to visit the site is on a private tour from whatever nearby city you're staying at, especially Avignon, which is most convenient. In a moment, I'll discuss public bus and train options, but first I'd like to tell you about Provence Reservation and the tour they provided for us led by Mark, which was really wonderful. Mark brought the site to life with knowledge and humor in a friendly way that made the visit really memorable. Okay, so this bridge is exceptional for its state of preservation. It's the best preserved Roman bridge. Modern technology, we built something bigger, of course. But 2,000 years ago, the technology was different, you know. The principle of hearing machine was the same, but the energy was different. And the pipe on the top is the largest pipe in the Roman world, too. It's 1 meter 20 large, 1 meter 80 high. So everything was built just to enable the big pipe to cross. Crazy, huh, to imagine that? It's very impressive, huh? 
now for us the symbol of civilization is gas, computer, camera. Uh, in the Roman time it was water. Uh, water is a very big symbol of them civilization. In the highest, it's not the longest. The longest is in Segovia at 750 meters long. So you see the view, huh? the site is not too bad too. Huh? So what's you, amazing is the bridge and the site. So uh, the Romans decided to, to span the river right here because the river is a bit narrow. Look at that, it's a bit narrow. Huh? This aqueduct was working more or less 500 years. That pretty well wraps up our in-depth look at Pont du Gard. And now I'd like to close out with some logistical suggestions. The normal starting point is at the excellent visitor center where you can get the free map that shows various paths and viewpoints. You can also pick up an audio guide at the center, browse in the shops, use the restrooms, have a snack, and look at the large poster boards that display walking routes in detail. There's also a museum with models, multimedia screens, and reconstructions to explain the sites. There are basically three different ways to get to Pont du Gard. One is if you have your own private rental car. Another is taking public transit. There's a public bus that comes by here. And finally, you could take a private guided tour. As we mentioned already in our visit with Provence Reservation, there are a variety of nice tours on offer from Avignon or if you're staying in Arles, you'll find a private tour is the most convenient and comprehensive way to do it. These day trips usually include other sites such as Saint-Rémy, Labo, and or Ouzès, as we show you in some of our other videos about this region. On the other hand, you can travel on your own by public bus and train. For example, if you're staying in Avignon, you could take the train to Nîmes which is also a lovely city to visit. Tour around, enjoying a walk through Nîmes, and then take the public bus from Nîmes to Pont du Gard, which takes about one hour, drops you off at a traffic circle, 10 minutes walk from the visitor center. And then when you're finished your visit to Pont du Gard, another public bus will take you from there on back to Avignon where you began your day. That also takes about one hour. A little complicated, and the bus service is not very frequent, but it can be done. We have many more movies about Provence and the south of France in our collection, including Avignon, Arles, and the artistic village of Saint Paul. We'll be taking you to the stone village of Le Beau, have some crepes, down to Nice, the beach, the old town. We'll see it during the daylight and take you back there at night. We'll be visiting historic sites and meeting the people. Pont du Gard, ancient Roman aqueduct. The quaint village of San Remy will charm you on market day with street music. You'll see shop dogs and ancient arcades. The daily joy of life in the streets is one of our specialties. We'll do some downtown shopping and enjoy traditional recreation. You can also find Aix-en-Provence, Cannes, and nearby Antibes along the sunny shores and Marseille in our series of travel videos. All the best of Southern France. Look for them in our collection.